if you have diabetes, you have a higher risk of developing heart disease. And if you have a heart attack, you have higher risk of heart failure. But before you get there, there are so many things yeah. that contributes to that lifestyle, movement, nutrition, stress, all of that plays a big role. I grew up overweight. I lost my dad to stroke and he had a heart attack before that. I've seen my mom's family battle with diabetes. For the longest time, I thought I was going to end up the same. And now I'm here investigating the link between these two diseases. Ignorance is not bliss in this case. The earlier and the faster you know about your health condition, the more things that you can do to prevent it to get worse if it's in that trending direction. My hope is that I will never need to face that ever. But at the same time, we don't know what the future holds. What we can do is to have full control of our present and enjoy our present. I am still trying to better myself every day and I want to grow old, feeling healthy, looking healthy. Hi everyone, welcome to The Gabby Ree Show. On this show, we discuss the complex topics around relationships, health, fitness, family, business, and so much more with the world's leading experts. My goal is to simplify these topics and give you practical takeaways that you can start using in your life today. We all know that living a healthy, balanced life can be challenging. So let's try managing life a little better and have some fun along the way. Because after all, life is just one big experiment. Hi everyone, welcome to the show. My guest today is Lat Mansour. He has his PhD in physiology and this led him down the field of cardiovascular health with diabetes. So he really started looking at how do patients function their heart health with diabetes, and that led him to how hypoxia can really impact your health. And then one step even further, talking about metabolic, metabolic health, and how do we correct metabolic inflexibility? On these shows, we talk all about metabolic and mitochondrial function, all these things, but really what is it? And now Lat is working with a company called Ketone IQ. You might know that as HVMN. I personally have used the product. I do not work with the company, but I have used it for focus. It's a way for me personally, where you get ketones. I get to focus for a solid two to three hours, especially if you're not moving around. It might be a little shorter if you're exercising or sauning, let's say, and not impacting my sleep negatively. So Lat spends his days trying to figure out, hey, how do we get people to be more metabolically flexible? That means you can burn all kinds of fuel. Your body knows what to use when. And there's some really interesting conversations around, around well, how about a high-performance athlete? Does it impact them? Low carb, low fat, high fat, which diet is better? You'd be surprised. And householders. And what you find is in these conversations, and we really get deep into it, is a diet for a householder, someone who's doing weight management, let's say, and trying to just kind of keep even energy is more important in a certain way than a high performance athlete, where the high performance athlete would sort of burn almost any fuel the householder needs to be more conscientious. And he talks all about what are the things that are good for brain health, something I know that we're all interested in. And most importantly, Lat comes from a place of understanding because he himself was late to the game of exercise and nutrition. He grew up in Malaysia and then went to university and at university was introduced to training, something that he was really intimidated with. And so you can hear when he talks about this, how passionate it is and how sensitive he is because he understands, hey, that could be me too. Like I'm not a guy who grew up exercising regularly or understanding about food or ketones or ketosis and how I can make choices that support not only my health, but how I feel and how I perform. So I hope you enjoy my show with Lat Mensor. Lat, thank you for coming to my home. And thank you for having me. Coming out of your way. Um, and, you know, we threw you right into it, having talking to some NBA players and trying to help them figure out how to stay energized in the third quarter. Um, maybe we can just, you know, sort of say, share your journey from Malaysia to here, to San Francisco, 
and to the work you're doing now? I would love to. Um, born and bred in Malaysia. Um, I didn't leave my country until I was 20. I left Malaysia to go to the UK to study biotechnology for my undergraduate at the University of Nottingham. And at the end of my degree, I thought, you know, having a science degree was not enough because what am I going to be a lab assistant or, you know, it's going to be very difficult. I want to really pursue my passion in science. And mind you, my late father passed away when he, I was 17, right before I had to choose my major um, to do in the university. And he always wanted me to become a medical doctor. I didn't have that passion in me. But my whole family was guilt tripping me because they were like, this is your dad's last dying wish. Oh my gosh. Um, my mentor, who was my cousin, he was the only person. It's not a conflict who, of interest. <laughs> yeah, he was the only person who supported me. And he told me, and I remember it until today, that he said, whatever choice you make will be the right one. As long as you just pursue it with your passion and don't look back with regret. And... I was really interested in biotechnology and genetics and the science of it. And so I did apply for biotechnology and I completed my study. But then I was like, okay, I want to do a postgraduate, but then I'm not sure if I want to spend the next three, four, five, six years in, in the lab for a PhD. So I'm just going to look for a master's. And it was really difficult because I come from a... a, a um, middle class family. So I can't, I didn't even afford, I couldn't even afford my, my undergraduate. I got a scholarship from the Malaysian government. So I went back to them and I said, you know, hey, like I want you to do a postgraduate. They're like, yeah, you can, we can sponsor you, but you have to get a first class honors, which is equivalent to a distinction here. Um, and then I have to get accepted into good university. And at that point I was on track, but I was not there yet. Mm. So I worked very hard. Um, in my final year, finally got my first class honors. And then I got accepted into Columbia University for my master's in biotechnology. And they said, okay, we'll sponsor you. So you were interested maybe in communication in a certain way anyway? Exactly. Because exactly. you like people. I like people. I like to be the bridge. I don't want to spend my days facing test tubes every day. Yeah. I, I like to connect and talk to people like yourself and share what I've learned throughout my life. Because I grew up overweight. I lost my dad to cardiovascular, to stroke, and he had a heart attack before that. I've seen my mom's family, like a lot of them being obese and battle with diabetes. For the longest time, I thought I was going to end up the same. I thought there was like no... Like it's just a sentence that you can't control? because yeah, it's genetics. Mm. Not until later that I learned that there are things, there are still things that I can do. I might still end up there, but there are still things that I can do. And that gives me hope. And that gives me life. That gives, the, that gives me fun to live life and to try things and to try and change my body composition, try and change my lifestyle. And I think that whole lesson, it took much longer than, than it needed to be if I would have known earlier. Well, okay. So given all that, you know, and you talk all about lifestyle every single day, you have, you know, whether it's food or exercise or things like that, you are combining and incorporating lifestyle in your messaging, even with knowing all this and knowing about epigenetics and all of these things, you still think, oh, I, I would end up with the same uh, sentence as my father. Don't you think you can, bl you've blown that out of the water for yourself by now? I think the I'm not going to completely push that away because genetic does play a role, right? It still increases your risk to a certain extent. Obviously, what you do with your life contributes to that or prevents that. My hope is that I will never need to face that ever, right? But at the same time, we don't know what the future holds. What we can do is to have full control of our present and enjoy our present. Mm -hmm. That's all I can do. No. That's why I'm not going to say that I will never face that or neither am I going to say that I will end up being there. I say I may, I may not, but time will tell. And Isn't your lifestyle very different than your father's? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, he was a smoker as well. Mm -hmm. And I did smoke for seven years. You I, did? I gave up when I was 22. And that mm -hmm. was also when I started exercising and losing like 45 pounds in like four months. So what prompted you 
uh, first of all, that both things happening. I, I mean, obviously there's something natural about starting to exercise and giving up smoking because they don't work out as well together. Yeah. And what happened? What did you see? Who did you learn from that you thought, oh, wait a second, I'm going to go to the gym? This is a funny story. So I was in south of France, Bagnols, is a small city. Um, I was there representing my university for a course called Biology in Space. Once upon a time, I did want to study biology in space. I even applied to the professor in University of Autonoma Madrid to look at how biology behaves in space. And I thought it was so cool. So I went to this course for like two weeks. I know it's random. Yeah. And then there were, it was it was organized by the European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency and all these like um, experts that were there giving us like talks and lectures. One of the lady from the Russian Space Agency, she saw me smoking outside the lecture before I, I went in. Wait, and you say, did you say she was Russian? Yeah, she's oh, Russian. Oh, yeah. So they're really soft with their words. Okay, great. Uh, and she <laughs> literally looked at me before walking into the lecture hall and she was like, stop smoking, save your money and buy vodka. <laughs> like literally, those were the words that I remember until today. And I was 22 then. And for some reason, something resonated with me. And after the lecture, I, I pulled her aside and I said, you seem like you have something to tell me. Let's talk. So we sat down. She, she pulled out a paper and she started drawing the, the DNA structure. She said her husband is a lung cancer on oncologist mm -hmm. and she has seen so many lung cancer patients be where they were because of smoking. And because I was studying biotechnology and genetics, I knew exactly what she meant. And at that point, I felt like a hypocrite if I don't stop because the fact that I know the science behind it. And if I still do it, I can't get past myself. So there and then I gave up the rest of the cigarettes, just threw it away and went cold turkey. Granted, the first year was difficult. Did you put on weight? Because a lot of people put on weight. A lot of people put you on weight. Because you munch and chew, Correct. you know, Correct. snack and, and stuff. And food tastes better. Oh, there's always that. Yeah. And food tastes better when you give up smoking. Yeah. Um, oh, interesting. And that's also why you 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 probably put on weight. I didn't because I started exercising at the same time. Oh, okay. For the first time, I exercised voluntarily. I hated exercise. Oh, you'd have to have that. like instructors that were like, no, okay, all the kids so, are going to run and that's what you're doing? No, that was in university. I just did it voluntarily because one of, so that was in summer in my second year, right before that, like two, three months before that, I already started exercising because my housemate, Leanne, she's a state swimming captain back in Malaysia. She's like, hey, I've got a beach holiday coming up. Do you want to come jog with me? I need to get in shape. I was like, you know, I don't jog, right? She was like, yeah, but just, it's like around the lake in the university, you mm -hmm. know, it's like two kilo yeah. kilometers. It's like, sure. Went with her. I was blue. I couldn't breathe. I was dying. And there was a couple in front of us, at least 70, 60, 70 years old, faster. They were like in shape and they were cheering me on. I was 22. I was so embarrassed. And ever since, ever since then, I was like, I'm going to go do it every day. Just out of like my pride, just so that I yeah. can say I can complete a, a, a circle and come back to my home without, without stopping. like stopping. So what what would you say to somebody? Because I think a lot of people, exercising is intimidating. It is. They really want to. They just don't know how to enter and they don't, it doesn't, I mean, it, it, it's scary. It doesn't look fun. I don't want to hurt myself. So what would you say, uh, at least from your experience, mm -hmm. It was the way, the introduction, because now I see you lifting big weight and doing all this stuff. Oh, I see you out there. All... <laughs> You've been doing your research. <laughs> no, but just what, I, what is it I that you say, would say? I that... would say find a friend. Yeah. Do it with someone. Someone you care about, someone who cares about you. Do it slowly. You don't have to start and go, you know, zero to hundred today. Just start with walking. Go with a small jog. Do one kilometer what I did was because there was a lake around the university that we ran around, I aim for the next tree every day. Just one tree ahead. And then I'll walk back because I can't run back. So I'll, I'll run to the, the eighth tree. Yeah. I'll walk back. The next day I'll run to the ninth tree and then I'll walk back. And I think sense of progress, it's what kept me going. And I didn't even do it because I didn't do it to lose weight. I did it. 
because in spite of, you know, all that embarrassment. Um, four months later, I lost like 45 pounds without even realizing. I knew I was losing weight. I didn't know how much weight I was losing. Yeah. But then I looked really, really like unhealthy because all I did was jogging. So I was just losing, just, just doing cardio. I was like, you know, there was no muscle there. Um, that was when I started jo joining the gym. And again, to your point, that was the moment of intimidation. Oh, yeah. And um, there was a trainer. And good thing it was a university gym. So everyone was university students. So it's right. like less intimidating. Sure. So you don't see like a power lifter lifting like 300 pounds, sure. you know, next to me. Bodybuilders. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So a, a trainer who worked there, you know, kind of saw how hard I, I, I worked. And, and he just came and gave me like advice. So that was my motivation, I think, yeah. you know, surround yourself with people who want to get fit, who want to be healthy. Community plays a big role. Yeah, it does. I mean, you, you see my house. The only reason these people are over here is so that we'll keep going. We're tired. <laughs> and and it's, tired. it's inevitable. Everyone feels tired every now yeah. and again. I think people get a mis, you know, they have the misconception that you fly out of bed every day and you're just like, I can't wait. It's yeah. like, that's not how it works. No, that's not. So you go, you finish um, at Oxford and then what, tell me, where your life takes you. So at Oxford, my research study was in cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Mm -hmm. So I looked at type two, the metabolism of type two diabetic heart in hypoxia, which is low oxygen. Yes. The funny thing is initially I was meant to study stem cells, cardiomyocytes, how to regenerate a damaged heart with stem cells. But when I got there, there was a change of like projects around and they were like, hey, La, do you mind if you, we swap your project to, to this project, this, you know, before I even started? I was like, you know what? It's just meant to be because my mom's side has high prevalence of diabetes. My late dad died of stroke and cardiovascular disease. And now I'm here investigating the link between these two diseases. Mm -hmm. I was like, yes, sure, absolutely. And... From there, my interest and passion towards chronic diseases grew even more. And the more I know, the one, the more I want to try it on myself, as well as like share the, the knowledge, right? In your studies, just going back a little bit, mm -hmm. talking about hypoxic, because as an athlete, selfishly, I, right, we're always talking about hypoxic training and yes. doing more with less air and trying to be efficient. You saw the pool training out there that you can be, you can work hypoxic very well. Could you just, because uh, I'm really curious, the relationship between um, hypoxia, diabetes, and your heart, and how all of these things, how one impacts the other? Because I, this is very interesting. Yeah, so naturally, in a healthy heart, so our heart is an omnivore, right? Our heart cannot stop working. So it will chomp up any substrate, any fuel you provide it, correct? Normally, in under normoxia, normal oxygen level, our heart would use about 70% fat and then, you know, the rest, well, 70 to 75% fat and then the rest glucose. But in hypoxia, the heart switches. It switches over to glucose because if you know about metabolism, then the first step of glucose metabolism is glycolysis. Glycolysis does not use oxygen to create ACP, which is an energy currency in the cell. So the heart will switch over when it gets a signal that, hey, it's low oxygen, but the heart still needs to go get going. So I'm going to produce energy using glucose. The problem is it doesn't pro produce a lot of energy, right? So you get lactic acid buildup and all of that, and it will eventually go down to the Krebs cycle, the mitochondria, and create more or more ATP. But that is a temporary solution. So most normal healthy hearts would switch over. What we have seen in diabetic hearts is metabolic inflexibility, is the inflexibility of the heart to switch over to, um, to glucose. And for this study particularly, I used a type 2 diabetic rat model. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds cruel, like we made the rats type 2 diabetic and then we put them in hypoxic chamber and then we look at the heart metabolism. 
So what we've seen is that because of the high fat diet that we fed the rats and the inability of uh, the rat to metabolize um, the other substrate as well, it stays on to um, fat metabolism. And as a result, oxidative damage accumulates and their heart gets more damaged. And when we measure the reoxygenation, let's say when we put them back into normal oxygen level, they get arrhythmia and their cardiac function decreased significantly compared to the rats which are healthy and can switch back and forth between the fats and glucose. That's why when I talk about metabolic health, it's the ability of our bodies to use substrates within our bodies that we have access to depending on the situation that we are in. If you're going for a sprint, you should be able to use glucose better because sprint is an anaerobic and you will go into hypoxic situations. If you're going for a long run on cardiac zone two level, you'll be able to use more of your fat storage because you have time to really mobilize the fatty acids from your storage, get it into the cells, create ATP, and then fuel your run. So that's what we found. Um, so we looked at acute hypoxia. We look at chronic hypoxia. So over two weeks, what happens? Um, and Wait, they're let's both just, the same. Let's, let's talk about that because I understand that from a training point of view. Mm -hmm. And we always talk about breathing. Everyone's talking about breathing. Um, you know, in ancient cultures had a, definitely a better relationship with breathing. But the nature of having a, a good uh, tolerance for CO2 so that you had enough CO2 in your body to absorb oxygen from the bloodstream... But when you say hypoxia, these patients, let's say, why are they in hypoxia? Are they are they scrubbing their CO2 and they're not actually oxygenating the body? What's going on that they're even in that? I mean, a lot of time. So if, in this particular research, we're looking at hypoxia as a subset of ischemia. And okay. ischemia means like a blockage of um, arteries so that you have lack of blood flowing into the heart. Um, so you have lack of substrates going in, you have lack of oxygen going in, and you have lack of wastes uh, going out. Okay. So it's just a subset because high, because oxygen is so important in our bodies that the reaction, the response to the lack of oxygen is so quick that we can measure it right away. So and whereas if you measure ischemia, there's so many things, like I said, you've got substrate going in, substrate not going out oxygen there's so many things going on it's hard to pinpoint what mechanism so so the whole point of this is to outline and and to investigate the exact mechanism at which why diabetic hearts behave poorer in such a situation compared to a healthy heart now can you just again because i'm just going to utilize the fact that i have you in front of me <laughs> i have a high performing athlete mm -hmm. and they are looking to get every edge that they can um, and so they are training in hypoxic states. So can you share with me not only what's happening in their body and in their heart, but also maybe some of the best ways or the most beneficial ways to do that? So I've heard about the, the those hypoxic training and the restricted you know bands and and all that. I'm I have to say I have to be honest. I'm not entirely uh, well versed okay. in that area. And but. As far as metabolism goes, I can talk a bit about that. So if you are, you know, healthy and normal and you're working in a hypoxic environment, you are essentially also upregulating um, hematocrits and um, uh, erythropoietin. Like you are upregulating your red blood cells. So over time, you are essentially having a more efficient carrier system for oxygen delivery so that's why so the adaptation to hypoxia so that again it requires you to be able to adapt to begin with right, right. if you are metabolically dysfunctional then it'll be difficult for you to in fact it'll put you in a situation where you might you know go through um a heart attack or something right something like that yeah something <laughs> like that but if but, you but let's say let's yeah. is it possible if somebody that they're eating well they're sleeping mm -hmm. um they've maybe they're building up into this training they're just not going full bore mm -hmm. what's happening with their heart uh 
so their heart's just more efficient at switching over and saying, hey, whatever fuel is available, I'm good. I'm working efficiently. I've got enough coming in and waste going out. Yep. And that's how their system is working. Yes. Is there a long term, like you listen to endurance athletes, yep. there's always a cost at the other end of that, though, on the heart. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, granted, like if you think about it, if you are in hypoxia, you don't have enough oxygen delivered to your body and you don't have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen around your heart is going to automatically work harder right it will pump harder it will pump faster it will increase heart rate to increase oxygen saturation around the body so what you're looking for when you train in those situations is for your body's adaptation so that you your body will say like this is the new normal now so i'm gonna be able to lower my heart rate increase my red blood cells increase my delivery of oxygen and then when i go back to normoxia I can do it even more efficiently with lower heart rate with my already existing, you know, red blood cell pool and push myself further. So I think that is the idea behind that. But obviously when it comes to the nuance of the training and the methods and the methodology, I think, you know, well, that's every individual too. So when you hear of an athlete, like they talked about Lance Armstrong and I think Laird, my husband, um, because I've gone bike riding with him an awful lot. And I'm huffing and puffing and sweating and he slapped weights onto his bike and he's up in the hill and down and checking on me in a regular speaking voice. When you hear of these athletes that have very high VO2, mm-hmm. is it just that that system is working well or is there also something different in their heart? That's a great question. Do, um, do we know? I I don't know if okay, we know fair exactly. Enough. I yeah, just, but I think, I, I think yes, it's the system for sure. Yeah. But I think it's also... It could be genetics as well. Well, they say that it's genetic. It could be genetics as well. I always feel well. gypped on that. You I know, know I, mean? I know. I mean, think about me being born in cardiovascular diabetes. <laughs> but but you, you don't know. You might have, you could be, have good VO2. You yeah. don't know. You know, I'm just grateful I've got a good You have high good IQ. Brain. Be quiet. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just grateful I've got a good brain. That's it. <laughs> so, you know, before, before we um, move off this, if, if, you know, in talking about diabetes and having studied this and the relationship of how the heart works with that, um, Is there anything that you, as somebody who wants to communicate to the general public, if if you sort of could say one thing to people who maybe they are navigating um, being diabetic, um, is there anything that you you sort of would say, hey, you know, just a reminder of something that feels really important? I think I'll go back to what I said, that ignorance is not bliss, Mm. right? Know your body. And nowadays we have so many different technology that you can measure your body's parameters. You can measure sleep, you can measure your bloods, you can measure, you know, continuous glucose monitor. Yeah, I see um, you have one on. Uh, level, I, I, right? I was, yeah, levels, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just recently interviewed Dr. Casey Means. The yeah, she's incredible. Chief medical officer. Yeah. And she's so You too, animated. it's like the happy couple. I mean, meaning <laughs> both people are so happy. Yeah. No, yeah, um, no. She, in, that, in that episode, I remember she was <laughs> taking ketone IQ. Yeah. We took an hour before and then we <laughs> measured again an hour late at the end of the podcast and she was so shocked. And we got her reaction on camera. Yeah. It was so genuine and authentic because she was like oh my god i'm at 1.4 from 0.2 yeah oh yeah and and she was like i can't believe it and we are you got got it on camera yeah so i think we have so many things that we can use so many tools that we can use to inform us about how our bodies are doing sometimes like it's important for us to recognize our body biosignals, but sometimes if people are already in the dysfunctional state, they might not be able to recognize those signals or their signals might be a bit misleading. Yeah. Right. Because for example, if you say like, oh, I know when I'm hungry, but then if your hormonal system is out of whack, then maybe you feel hungry when you're not supposed yeah. to be hungry. So I would say know your body well, know your health state well, and then figure out what to do to optimize it. Yeah. Because a healthy person can still optimize their health and can still optimize their performance. A not very healthy person can also optimize. So anyone yeah. can, you know, essentially optimize. Well, and like you said, you in three or four months, you lost all this weight. Your body wants to be healthy. We just have to sometimes push it into the environments and help it along. And I think that people don't think that, oh, they can feel good or they can lose the weight, but it's just putting yourself in that environment. Um, And what I'm interested in is like you really, again, through this process of what you're doing, um, you talk a lot, a lot, a lot about lifestyle and food and movement and um, 
you know, even things for your brain. I'm just curious if you coming from such a medical and science background, um, it must be really interesting when you're always trying to bridge the two. Yeah. Cause like where I come from, I'm way on the other side, right? Like I'm all about lifestyle only, but you're a science guy. And so it must be interesting to, to, you know, find the balance for you. So I think the difference there is that I'm not a clinical scientist. Okay. Where clinical scientists learn a lot about like intervention. They use what drugs to block what pathway to make people feel better. I'm a basic scientist. They say basic, they call it basic scientist, but most people don't understand. They're like, oh, he's just basic, right? <laughs> You're not basic. <laughs> but basic scientist means that you, you work on, you know, mechan mechanism of action on cells, on animal models. So you're yeah. not working on humans. So whenever you hear clinical, it, it means humans. Um, and basic scientist is anything else. And you measure, you know, what you want to investigate in terms of mechanism of action. When that happens, so my understanding is how things work. My passion is wondering and, and working on and researching how our bodies work. So for me to bridge from the science part to the lifestyle part was not that hard because I wasn't focused on the intervention to begin with. I was more focused about how our bodies naturally work mm -hmm. versus how our bodies would work if we're sick. Right. So you understand the mechanisms and you were not attached to necessarily an intervention right. or a drug um, or a drug or, or just fixing the symptom. I'm yeah. interested in the root cause. And that's what, you know, these mechanism of actions are, right? They're usually where the root causes are, but most the, the most important thing is that when you do a PhD, you're so narrowed into one niche yeah. that it's hard to see the big picture. And myself included, you know, I was looking at the heart in hypoxia, like very specific situation here. But only after I come out that I, I communicate with people and talk to people and work in different industries that I realize that Yes, there is a dysfunction there. If you have diabetes, you have a higher risk of developing heart disease. And if you have a heart attack, you have higher risk of heart failure. But before you get there, there are so many things yeah. that contributes to that. Like you are looking at, again, lifestyle, movement, nutrition, you know, stress. And all of that plays a big role yeah. in in contributing to that small little narrow area. It is interesting where we do, we have so much information and yet, and so we, in no time before have we been able to really help ourselves, but I also think the information has made it so confusing for people. So for people listening, a lot of people are going to know what H, uh, HVMN is, but can you, and I, I certainly um, have used it in the past. We joked that I think in 2018, it was on my pool side uh, nonstop. I have a friend, Elijah, that that was like the crack of the, the summer. We used it all summer long. Um, maybe you can just explain um, what the brand is, what the intention behind the, the thinking behind the brand. And, um, and even we were discussing earlier, the original developments with DARPA. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. So HVMN stands for health via modern nutrition. And as it sounds like, you know, it is what it sounds like. We, push for healthier lifestyle we know that our metabolism is under attack 88 percent of americans are metabolically unhealthy i'm not sure some people claim that it's reaching to 90 percent, which is bad news um what can we do as our part to push for better understanding better education better information about our health and not just through our products but through things like this, our HBM podcast that I host right. and um, and social media content. So that's our sort of mission and vision. And that's why I, I joined them. I decided to join them. I think it aligns very well with my passion about helping myself, helping my family. I mean, we all start with selfish reasons. Like whatever we do, it starts with your selfish reasons, with your own experience. I mean, don't, you know... But how can Don't, you be connected to it if it doesn't mean something to exactly. you? Exactly. I think that's, I think it's a guide. That's normal. Yeah. Yeah. So just so we're really clear, can you define for people what yes. metabolic health is? So metabolic health, um, I will always connect it to metabolic flexibility. 
it's the ability of our body to use the resources that we have access to based on certain situations we are in, whether we're exercising, whether we're sleeping, whether we are in hypoxia, our body's natural ability to upregulate and downregulate and know that metabolism is always in a wave fashion. It gets secreted, it goes down, it goes back up, insulin, hormones, same thing. The goal is not pile on what is good, but rather keep what it's what is good within the optimal Goldilocks zone. Mm. So just because, for example, ketones are good, doesn't mean that you have to just pound ketones, you know, one after another. Um, same thing like glucose is not inherently bad because we can, we need glucose to function, but too much glucose, too much ultra processed glucose, that's when it, it gets bad. So that's, that's metabolic um, health. Um, and then you mentioned about DARPA, about, you know, how you heard about HVMN in 2018. So in 2017, we brought the first exogenous ketone into the market. And I think I should explain what ketone is, right? <laughs> yeah, I think we're just going to explain it all. So it's people under, have a tool and understanding. Mm -hmm. So ketone, a lot of people, when they hear ketones, they think of ketogenic diet. It goes deeper than that. Ketone is just a molecule and it's not novel either. It is as ancient as the first mammal that are available, uh, that, that have access to fats and can metabolize fat. That's how all this molecule is. It is broken down from fat and created in your liver to produce energy. But the condition at which ketones are being produced is very specific. It needs to be really low in glucose. Like your body needs to be in really low glucose storage and blood glucose. And what happens if it's not? If it's not, then you have insulin going up. Mm. When you have insulin going up, insulin is a very powerful signaling molecule and hormones. When you have insulin going up, it will send signal to the liver saying that, hey, you have energy, i.e. sugar. So you don't need to break down fat to create ketones. That's why you need to really lower your glucose to produce ketones. And in modern days, how we achieve that is via ketogenic diet, where you restrict your diet, uh, restrict your carbs in your diet severely, or you go on intermittent fasting because then your insulin will stay low and then your body starts to or kickstart the ketogenesis process, which is ketone production. Why would you need ketones when you have fats you can use for energy? And even if you don't have glucose, you still have fats. Mm -hmm. The reason is because of the blood-brain barrier. There is a barrier that stops big molecules from entering the brain to create energy. So fats are very big molecules and it cannot pass that barrier. So in order to provide the brain <laughs> with I just, energy... I just have this image of like, imagine a fat could penetrate your... You'd be like, you know... It can't get past the bouncer. Yeah, I mean, you'd just be like this. Mm -hmm. So the ketones get broken down. So the keto yeah. so the ketone is a smaller molecule, smaller mm -hmm. version of these fats molecules and get um, shuttled to the brain. And recently I got interviewed by Dr. Mindy Pelt and mm -hmm. she described it so nicely and I'm going to steal it and, and, and I'm going to you know credit it to For her, obviously. She explained it in an ancestral human point of view because when... You know, you don't have storage systems, so you don't have ways to store food. So you will go out and hunt, you will eat it, and then you finish it, and then you go hungry, and then you go hunt again. So during that, that hungry period, even though you are low on resources, you still need to be focused, and you still need the physical prowess to go hunt. To go get that so food. So how does that work? Mm. That's when you have ketones running in your body. That's when you start using your fat storage and, and create ketones so that one, it gives your brain that mental clarity and focus, and two, gives you that performance boost so that you can go get the go next get the food. You know, it's interesting. I, you know, you'll the more you you get into this and fasting for a long time, everybody should fast, right? And then more studies have been done on women, I think until 2000 or I don't know, 93 or something, studies were only done on men. And then now we're starting to learn, oh, wait a second. If you're, if you're a performing woman, you're, you perform better fed. 
if you are a middle-aged woman fasting, it's sort of like, what are you going to use it for? Are you using it for, um, sort of a, a comp they, I love the politically polite ways. Like people talk about body composition. You mean controlling your weight. Um, or I often say like, you know, those weeks you go through and all of a sudden you get loosey goosey and you're eating mm -hmm. and you think, you know what, I'm just going to fast for a day or two to pull it back in. Cause then you're happy you eat anything. Yeah. Right. So th there's this, but in living, um, you know, I live with my husband a very long time and there was something about, and I know there's a lot of information about women did a, quite a lot of hunting and, and we were, you know, forging and doing other mm -hmm. things. So I'm not suggesting they weren't hunting, but I often sort of thought, I wonder for the men if fasting, cause fasting sort of always good for men was because of this thing. That's a very it's like interesting point. you go out, you go to hunt and maybe you didn't catch something and you guys are all together. Well, guess what? You need that energy to go again, where maybe we had the opportunity if we were sort of in a different space where we could at least nibble on something all of the time. So I often wondered, cause you know, we would fast in this house and Laird would thrive and I was ready to kill somebody. And I really was like, what is wrong with me? And I was so glad there's a the Stacy Sims and Gabrielle yes. Lyon. Yes. They're both um, a little more kind of protein female focused. Yes. And I, listen, I, I think it's a great thing, but I think people have to really understand um, all these nuances. So when you talk about it from the ancestral way, I really appreciate that because I, I really believe we live in such a modern world and we want to separate so much from some really fundamental biological things about ourselves that the more we could we could be entertained and interested in that i think we would know ourselves better mm -hmm. and um anyway so I, I thought about that a lot because you know it's like hey if you miss that one opportunity to kill that one animal it, you can't be too tired because you needed you know more energy so i i really ap appreciate that so okay so ketones um, they can penetrate the blood brain barrier. Mm -hmm. They're very important. It's the oldest studied diet because of epilepsy yep. that there is. More than I mean, 100 years. Right. People think, oh, it's a fad. It's like, no, ketogenic only came by as a byproduct, really, of epilepsy. Correct. Um, so I, I think that that's important because I, I personally don't know that any fads, I think doing it smart is it shouldn't be a fad mm -hmm. and i i know that you can monetize it and call it something and it makes sense but besides that so so we have this tool like yep. you're saying um and and so what is the connection just out of curiosity with metabolic health and ketones or being having is it just that flexibility i can burn whatever i need in whichever situation i am so the area of metabolic health and ketone is still very new. Mm -hmm. So especially um, exogenous ketones. I mean, we haven't had exogenous ketones for a long time. How many ketones? I mean, what are what are the types of ketones? So they are. So again, so ketone as a molecule mm -hmm. is um, natural. So there are three types of ketone bodies that our body produce. Acetoacetate, acetone and beta hydroxybutyrate. The last one, beta hydroxybutyrate or BHB is the main primary ketone that our bodies use for energy and get circulated around because it's the most stable. So it, but it interchange with the other forms. Acetone gets released through breath. So whenever you do the ketone breath um, test, it's usually measuring acetone. Uh, acetoacetate also comes out in urine as well. So whenever you measure like urine tests, there's acetoacetate. Blood, ke blood ketone tests usually measures BHB. So let's get that out of the way. What do you like? What do you like the blood test? Blood test is the most accurate okay. because the other two, so acetone does not necessarily, like it's usually one, two millimolar off to your blood ketone levels and acetoacetate, it shifts when you are more keto adapted. So when you are more keto ad adapted, you will have more BHB. So you have less acetoacetate. So some people measure their acetoacetate. They're like, well, I was in ketosis last week. Now I can't get into ketosis because your body is producing more BHB mm. and circulating more BHB. So that molecule itself is not novel. It's a great molecule. It's a great source of fuel. And there are multiple ways to get ketones into your body keto diet, fasting, and exogenous ketones. So let's talk about exogenous ketone. Exogenous ketones means it's ex an external source where you directly consume ketones. And this has been around for you know less than 10 years. Uh, initially, you have MCT oil. And I know Laird and I were talking about MCT and coconut oil. So those are fats. 
but it, it, it has high ketogenic properties where you, you take them, it has high uh, probability and higher conversion rate to BHB. That's why they are called like ket uh, high, highly ket ketogenic um, fatty acids, uh, you know, medium, tri uh, medium triglycerides. Um, and then in 2017, we brought the first ketone ester into the market. So HBMM brought ketone did they, ester. Did, who found, did somebody, how did they find it? I mean, so what? how they came about is very different from what we understood about keto diet and epilepsy. It was, it started when DARPA from the US military wanted to look for a, an efficient fuel that can fuel the military for a long and demanding mission. And we know the, the three macronutrients, protein, fats, and glucose. What else can we do to produce or, or provide fuel to these military personnel? And about tw more than 20 years ago with NIH, Dr. Uh, Richard Veach, he did a lot of studies around, around this and, and they finally came out with exogenous ketones. And ketone ester was the product of it because it manages to deliver ketones into the body at a high level, at, you know, just one dose versus taking straight BHB. Because if you, t they are also BHB free acid that you can take, but because it's acid acidic, it gives you heartburn and it gives you like acid reflux. Oh. And you can't take too much of it because of that. And be as a result, you can't get the ketone levels in the optimal level. Uh. So what ketone ester is... It must have been fun if you were the group that had to test that. I, I, tr I tried that. Oh, you did? Yeah, it wasn't fun. Mm. <laughs> um, so, so ketone ester is BHB bound with R13-butanediol in, in an ester bond. That's why it's called ketone monoester. But nowadays, we have ketone diester. So you have acetoacetate, two acetoacetate bound with a butanediol. You have two C6 molecules. C6 is a medium chain drug list, right? So mm -hmm. similar to like co coconut oil um, bound with butanediol. They all have like bounds with butanediol to create the ester bond. Um, and what's the, what is the, when you say the ester bond, why do we need to have that? So that's for the delivery into, into the body and bypassing that GI issue that, that pure <laughs> BHB has. Uh, but the problem is by nature, the ester bond has a very, very bitter flavor. Sure. So we got a $6 million contract with the military DOD right now using ketone ester to improve cognitive and physical performance in hypoxia. So high altitude, we simulate high altitude and mm. all of that. And we saw great results, but one of the tasks was to improve the flavor. And we worked with Monell uh, Research Center based in Philadelphia. They are like, they are the sensory olfactory sort of um, experts in, in flavor development. And they tried everything, natural sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, dairy, nothing worked. In fact, the ketone ester blunts the sweetness from all these sweeteners. They try, I believe like seven times sugar of uh, what's in Coke and, and like it was four, times what, four times sucralose <laughs> that's in Diet Coke. It, it, in the, in the placebo, you know, people with just the sweeteners, they, they'll rank sugar, like they'll rank sweetness as the main taste. As soon as you put ketone ester, the bitter goes up and the sweetness actually goes down. Right. Um, so, and so, so no benefit cause you've got all that sweetener and you still got this taste. Yeah. So the original product that was that you did with DARPA mm -hmm. is, was it that? That was a ketone ester. Yeah. So, I remember that. Yeah. Believe me. Yeah. And it was also very expensive. It was about 20, it was 25 grams for about 33 to $40. Mm -hmm. Right. And in two last year, early last year, we came up with ketone IQ and the active ingredient in ketone IQ is just half of what ketone ester was, RN3 butanediol. We found that RN3 butanediol is easier to flavor. So it tastes a little bit better. Granted, it still doesn't taste like juice. Um, <laughs> two, it's cheaper to manufacture. And three, because RN3 butanediol does not directly go into your blood as BHB, it gets filtered up um, by your liver and your liver converts it to BHB. Your liver has signal from the rest of your body. So if you already have a lot of energy, it will convert it slower. And so it doesn't spike your blood BHP to a, to a very high level. So earlier on, we talked about metabolism needs to be in this optimal level. Mm -hmm. Before this, we found that, okay, ketone is good. So 
ketone ester is able to push your blood ketone levels to a very high level. So that's that must be great. But then later on in 2021, there was a study by McCarthy et al. They looked at athletes with ketone ester um, having higher cardiorespiratory stress biomarkers because it lowered the pH of the blood it increases the acidity because BHB can also be converted to be hydroxybutyric acid. And as a result, they have higher breathing rate, heart rate to expel carbon dioxide to neutralize the blood. And even though in that study, they didn't decrease the performance of these athletes, they sure did increase the rate of perceived exertion, meaning that you feel like you're working out harder yeah. without the benefit of the performance. Imagine that, like you're taking a shot of ketones and all of a sudden you're... So because your body couldn't regulate through the liver... Um, half of it, because half of it is the BHB. Right. So it gets broken down in your gut. Um, the ester bond gets broken down in your gut. BHB goes directly into your blood mm. and increase your BHB. And then the BDO still goes to your liver. I see. So, it, so in... After this study, um, and the original product w did have a very specific flavor. Um, That's a very nice way to put it. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but you know, at that point, honestly, yeah. if you're doing things for performance yeah. or for something, it's like take it on the chin, the fact that it's available. But um, so... So then the, you decided for not, I want to, I don't want to use the word stability, but to change the formula to get this other kind of more even what the body needs at that moment. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, I think that, that's exactly right. And I think it's a learning process for everyone. Sure. Um, and it's a matter of transparency of the data and science and integrity because we could easily say, hey, um, push this data aside. Oh. And it's like, it still works. There are still studies that show that it improved you know, performance. Cherry pick those and keep selling ketone ester at a higher price. But we chose to do this instead and run more studies now. And now more and more researchers, I'm so, so happy in the past year and a half, all these seeds that we planted now coming back to us because all these researchers, they finally see the value of ketone IQ in all these different areas. We're looking at TBI, we're looking at cardiovascular disease. Uh, Grant just went out with university in Aarhus, Denmark, looking at heart failure patients, 250 patients for 30 days on ketone IQ. We're going to find out early next year if you get the grant. Um, traumatic brain injury with Naval Health Research Center. We'll find out also end of this year, early next year. We are running a study with like other brain centers. And it's just great to know that I can live in my conscience knowing that we change our formula, we change based on the data. Because I'm not going to lie, like a while ago, like, I was bothered because one of the running coach on his like social media commented and he used like really strong negative words on how disgusting we are marketing our product that we change our formula and we shove the old product under the bus and and we are like going back on our words i said the other option is cherry pick and pretend the new data didn't happen mm. i would rather say that hey what we understood about this was not fully accurate you can still and don't get me wrong, if there are certain therapeutic uses where you need to get that ketone level so high, three to five millimolar, I would say by all means use do, ketone ester because ketone IQ cannot get you past two point five millimolar, at least in our studies. Do you have? Is there an example where you'd want that? That, I mean, go go crazy. Um, uh, maybe like some cancer research. Okay. Um, treatments. Uh, I I yeah I I honestly don't know anything that you need that high of, of a level. And as we learn more about keto metabolism, now that, you know, more and more researchers are picking up that this is, first of all, safe, obviously, and second of all, beneficial. Now they're all running these separate studies. We're not paying for them. In fact, some of them, they buy directly from us. They're giving us business and we have no control over that data. And I would love to see all that data because then we have no conflict of interest they're not biased. Yeah. They are running it for their own hospitals and for their own patients. Um, so, so what if you were mentioning even for um, brain injury or or uh, things like that? So tell me how this works. Mm. 
for for a patient like that? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, ketones, when it's in your body, they've shown that it's preferentially being taken up by the brain and the heart, especially. Mm -hmm. So they measure, you know, blood going in, blood going out. Ketones get taken up independent of other substrates. So they'll still be taking up the other substrates like glucose and, and fats and all of that. But at the same time, ketones, if they're there, they're like to bring it in. And in the brain, when people have concussion or, or traumatic brain injury, we published a paper in this. If you search Latman so TBI ketones, I believe it's in 2021, the potential mechanism of traumatic brain injury and as an extension, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. Because if you look closely, there are a lot of similar hallmarks between brain injury and Alzheimer's, for mm -hmm. example. It's the deficiency and inability of the brain to metabolize glucose. So when someone has a traumatic brain injury or concussion, within 48 hours, what we have observed is that it upregulates glucose metabolism, hypermetabolism. It, it sucks in all the glucose for either energy or for um, mitigation of the damage. Oh. So it makes sense, right? But past that, within the week or months after, they have seen a lowered glucose metabolism. And in fact, some of the cases they saw an increase in lactate metabolism. So for like another substrate is taking over and long term as well, the, def the deficiency in glucose metabolism or the deficit in energy caused by that increased their risk of getting neurodegenerative diseases. And even before they developed that, that those diseases, the deficit in energy is what causing brain fog you know, coordination, memory loss, and all that stuff, right? It's essentially you are not sustaining your brain energy demand. Because ketone is a source of fuel, it is taken preferentially up by the brain. It uses a different pathway than the glucose pathway because it goes through, goes into the cell via a different transporter, monocarboxylase transporter versus glucose transporter. If there is a dysfunction or malfunction in the glucose pathway, it is not affected. So providing ketones in those situations, you are essentially providing an alternate path um, for your brain to really create the energy and use the energy. So if you are going to your destination, there is a roadblock, there is traffic jam, you got to find an alternate, alternative mm -hmm. path. And that's exactly what ketone is doing for you in these situations. Because if you look at it acutely within the 48 hours where you're upregulating glucose so much, you can provide that extra energy. Right. Right. And then if you look at the long term where the brain is not using glucose efficiently, you can still provide that energy to really compensate for that deficit. Do, is there, so if somebody takes too many ketones, they just breathe it out or pee it out. Is that pr pretty much it? I mean, there's no real, what's going to happen? Yeah. Uh, there's no real like, um, side effect of overdosing right. because it's like, it's like having glucose. If you overdose of glucose, you just feel sick. Right. You just throw up. Um, do know that it has 70 calories. One, one shot of this has 70 calories. Mm -hmm. So you can like overpile your number of calories. So you might just force your body to increase storage, essentially. You'd have to be motivated to have a bunch of those. Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm a, let's, let's talk about uh, householders and athletes. So yeah. if I'm a householder, um, I'm going to have a busy day. I have a presentation. Um, I'm feeling a little out of it. I'm going to work out in 30, in 20 minutes. Uh, is this the way I use uh, a product like Ketone IQ? So the way I explain it, the easiest way is whatever activity that uses your brain power, you will benefit from it. So if you're using it for performance, you'll still use your brain, right? You mm -hmm. use your coordination. Yeah. you got to focus. If you're going out for a ride, you're going out for a run, you have to be alert of your surrounding, you're balanced, you still use your brain. If you're using it for your homework, you're doing an exam, you're doing a podcast, I still use my brain, especially my brain. Yeah. And if I'm being asked, you know, difficult questions, I got to be really on point and have the memory recall to recall all the information that I know. So I will use this half an hour before I do such activities. 
Do you, um, is there sort of a, let's say we're not sauning or, and we're not exercising. So we're not in high cardiovascular. So we're not really rolling this out so quickly. How Mm -hmm. long would the effects last? It it lasts a few hours, a good few hours. So if I am just sedentary and let's say if my, it's my rest day, I'm not working out today. Uh, I would take one before a podcast and that should last me until the end of my work day. Mm-hmm. And if I feel like, oh, I'm low on energy and I'm still trying to concentrate m- concentrate or meet friends for, for dinner or whatever, and I'll take another cr- shot. And not crush your sleep, which and I not, like. Exactly. I love that. Yeah, it does not negatively impact your sleep yeah. because it's not a stimulant. And a lot of people, they ask, how can you have a product that gives you energy, but also gives you a calming effect so i mean you hear a lot of people talk about this when people say oh i became a vegetarian and yeah. or other people say i'm paleo or i'm yeah. ke- i mean keto- i'm doing a keto diet we i think the general consensus is they're all feeling better because they're just eating real food yep they're eating real food and I also mean, another point is the switch of diet <laughs> because the switch of the diet it, it it basically have you heard of the term homesis yeah of course right so mm-hmm. Homesis, where you are producing stress to to your body that is enough for your body to adapt, uh, but not too much that you break your body, right? So whenever someone changes their diet, they're increasing their diversity of the microbiome and their gut health and all of that. And eating real food, like you said, eliminating processed foods, they start to, to feel better. And I think there is a lot, that's why I always tell people I don't, condone like fully excluding one particular group food group unless you're doing it for therapeutic users where you have specific use cases where you have to eliminate certain food out of allergy or whatever right but otherwise like having a diverse groups of food like obviously the proportion and the ratio has to be right Mm -hmm. and i recently like created a video about about the scam of the pyramid of the food pyramid oh, of FDA. They still have it in the books in school. Yeah, they do. The nutritional pyramid. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Isn't it great? Uh, you know what? I, I, my friend, my friend, he was like, I've it's got like, a conspiracy theory. <laughs> I think nowadays they're going to start pushing. They're going to start push for, start pushing for meats and fixing that pyramid. But not because of the reason we know. It's because of all these rich people Mm. are having shares in the fake meat industry. Oh, I'm well aware of lab it. You mean like James grow- Cameron, who has <laughs> pea protein. And I have no problem saying it because right. that's on him. Yeah. And they do game changers and they tell partial truths. They don't, I mean, and I'm all for it. People should eat however it works best for them, but they don't tell the whole truth. Right. And, um, and then by the way, those... Oh, I mean, don't get me started. The go fa- on, go no, on. <laughs> I mean, the, the oils and the fake meats and the scientific project that is these meats that smell like, that is not meat, but smells like bacon. Mm-hmm. The stuff that's in there, I mean, I don't, and that's what I, it sort of gets, uh, this is one of my hopes of this show is I don't want, I'm not here to politicize any way of eating, um, any any way to do this because i think it's a it's a it's a distraction from people figuring out what works best for you but there's no getting around real foods better than everything Mm -hmm. and then work from there um you know i i don't personally understand how we've made that even tribalism uh at its highest level and i think it's an unnecessary distraction that um keeps people from like let's break bread however we we can and want to together but this thing about what and what they're doing to the to the meat is is radical. That's a great point when you talk about tribalism. I always feel like it's always us and them, and it's always like you have to pick a camp. I'm not picking. You you don't have to. And I know it's not sexy, you know, on social no. media. When, but at the end of the day, why can't we just be like normal human beings who all want to live healthy yeah. and choose real whole foods, and that's it. Yeah. And really strive for the transparency of the data out there the truth Hold on. Is- <laughs> i mean <laughs> we're eating, i think we're there trying to mask us up again i know i mean you know all of that it's like transparency is out the door that's why i always encourage people listen be your own advocate yeah. that's why i want to learn from people close to it and then i think if we really pay attention we know what feels good to us yes and do that and something might feel good for a while and then Maybe it stops feeling good. And then you say, maybe I'm eating too much meat. I'd like to 
to have three days a week, I only have vegetables or maybe, you know what? I've been a vegetarian for 10 years, but I've gone to see a doctor and maybe I'm getting, I, I'm uh, thinking of being pregnant. I need to add a little bit of animal protein, high quality. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It's like you're saying, even changing formulas, we, we have to be able to take new information and say, oh, you know what? I've got to change this a little bit. So it, it I think it, it's, it's a very, um, unnecessary feud when we should be all sort of fighting collectively together to have the best food system that we can. So well said. I mean, I don't know how you know, else to say You know it, what's but... the best quality that humans have over, say, animals? Our adaptation, mm. our adaptability, right? We can adapt so fast and so quick and we have that IQ to help us disseminate information and then adapt to it. So yeah. use it. It's your superpower. Yeah. And again, like you are the PhD of your own body. Nobody knows your body better yeah. than yourself. Yeah. So at the end of the day, your choice on what you want to put into your body. And also you are the monitor of what comes out in terms of the biofeedback. Yeah. And I, and I think a lot of us don't, we're so busy, we're on our phone. And, and my other favorite thing is the metric. Laird and I talk about this a lot. And I appreciate people using measurement as a source of motivation. Yep. But sometimes maybe just sit for a second and after you eat, be like, how do I feel? Mm -hmm. Do I feel tired? Did this food give me energy? Um, how's my stomach? How's What's going on? And I think sometimes we're always like, oh, well, my ring says, or my thing, it's like, how do you feel? Mm. You know, I don't, I hope that we don't lose a, a, a little bit of that. And I think the, you know, the more I have this conversation, I often say, I, I really, and I can oversimplify it that, uh, you know, metabolic, uh, function, mitochondrial sort of efficiency, chronic inflammation, community and purpose and, um, insulin, uh, sensitivity. Like if we sort of can manage those sort of few things that we're sort of in, that we're in pretty good shape, yes. you know, at least we have a shot yeah. to be in the conversation. It shows up over and over and over. But it, the ability to stay insulin sensitive, it's like, could we, and I appreciate you wearing a glucose monitor, but still one step back from that is staying insulin sensitive, end of story. And, um, and I think your point is, is really important. Um, mTOR. Yes. I, I, I just want you to talk about it and define it. Cause I think a lot of people don't know. Yeah. mTOR, it's, it's just a black hole essentially for even scientists like myself let alone somebody who is not into science it does so many things and people are claiming oh mTOR is good mTOR is bad mTOR is good mTOR is bad high mTOR is better no high mTOR is worse and it's just so many things that mTOR mTOR is just a a signaling pathway that is essential in energy metabolism you know, you have to look at it that way. And if it's a energy metabolism pathway, it can go either way, up or down. But think about this. Your body does not always need energy. Your body does not always consume energy. And your body doesn't always um, uh, use up energy. So mTOR would go up and down depending on the activity that you are doing. Mm -hmm. For example, in longevity studies, they saw mTOR being downregulated. And they're like, oh, mTOR, you don't want to upregulate it and you live longer. But then in exercise, uh, you see mTOR being increased because it's helpful for protein synthesis. And a study have shown with ketones and carbs and protein, you increase leucine-mediated mTOR activation. So it helps with recovery. And if you think about it, having some muscle mass, especially in elderly, is super helpful because it, it stops sarcopenia, it uh, prevents fall when you can't support your, your own exoskeleton. How about that, about longevity? Mm -hmm. Do you need mTOR or do you not? So I think that is why a lot of people have the misconception and, and everyone wants to look at metabolism as a straight line, as a linear process where it, okay, one is good, one is bad. Same thing with glucose, same thing with fat, like not same thing with inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people think about inflammation. They're like, oh, inflammation is bad nowadays. Even doctors nowadays, I think recently I saw a, a social media content, a doctor said that he needs to start referring inflammation uh, to chronic and acute inflammation yes. because acute inflammation is our natural 
defense mechanism where our bodies would react to infection, any form of dysfunction, and you know, we have a fever, is to essentially battle whatever invasion that is within our bodies. But then chronic inflammation right. is where it turns bad because you are breaking down your biological system so much that it's trying to fix it via upregulating inflammation. But it becomes a vicious cycle where you keep doing whatever you're doing to damage your body and the inflammation keeps cycling up to fix that. And over time, that inflammation just breaks down your, your system. The system just breaks down. Right. And therefore, the manifestation of diseases and symptoms. So uh, I, I don't know if I fully answer yeah, the question. Yeah, because I, I but, always like, hear people talking about mTOR. So I thought, okay, let's get yeah. a little bit into it. And I appreciate that, you know, everybody wants either the magic pill or it's one way or the other. But it's like, well, what state are you in? And what do you need? And what don't you need? And, and so I think it's, it's important yeah. to understand that there's a lot of uh, nuance when it comes to this. And um, I think that the question that people should ask is not whether or not mTOR is good for you. It's whether or not whether or not are you able to upregulate and downregulate mTOR at the right time mm. for the right purposes. So, for example, you're saying like, hey, if you've trained hard and you need to recover, then you need to be able to upregulate it. Correct. Right. And if you're not doing anything or resting, but see, that's different because resting could be in a recovery state. So what do I know? Exactly. All right. Exactly. See? All right. You know, it's an interesting thing I think about this too, to add it to that, which is I might even have best practices, but if I'm not managing my stress well, when it's in there and you can feel it and, uh, you know, it's like people, it's, it's all those variables. And I think even if we eat well and we try to get to bed and we exercise, if we aren't mitigating stress, whether it's emotional or other, I don't, I think it's, it's something, uh, stress might be the, the worst. Because and, it comes, it creeps up. Yes. And so it's a really interesting thing when you're, you, even when you kind of do the right things, if you're really paying attention, it's like, oh man, that stress will really get you. So I think it's important too, to have those conversations because those are usually then other things. It's not just the level of pace and hectic and how our life is. I think the stress becomes sort of unmanageable when we have kind of all these unfinished uh, things in our life, unfinished, unresolved conversations or, or what have you. You talked about skin, the importance of skin, skin health, and um, on our inflammation levels. I had never really heard, I mean, listen, I, I like nice skin. We, we talk about it this way, but I had not heard, and of course I know it's the largest organ on the body, but I had not heard that as far as the importance of it for inflammation levels. I think, just think of it like another organ that can manifest as an effect of a dysfunction within the body, except it's an organ that is external, so you can see it. Mm. Whereas the other organs, say liver, you can't see it until you measure your blood. So skin is something that you can see on the outsides. And as we know, our bodies react accordingly based on what's happening inside, what's, what's, what we're putting in and how we're working out on it. So it's a great storyteller of how the state of our bodies are. And just um, this morning, I saw a, uh, a friend of mine send me a reel of a doctor talking about uh, papilloma, and which are these like black skin tags that has like under your armpit and all mm -hmm. that. Apparently, it's a... Um, sign of insulin resistance. I didn't know that. I, 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 and I haven't looked into it. No, but I've heard that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like same thing. So it's a form of dysfunction that is manifesting on the outer level to give you that signal. And whatever you see that's happening to you that you don't think it's right, it's probably not. It's probably something that's hap happening beneath those layers that you need to take note of. Mm -hmm. And I'm always scared of that as well. Like I'm always like very conscious about, okay, what are the signs that I'm seeing? Okay, if I have like these rashes I was having like for a few months, I was like, I don't know what was it. I went to the dermatologist. They're like, oh, it's nothing. I'm like, okay. And then they'll it give, just went they'll, away. They'll give you a cream. They did. <laughs> yeah, but maybe it's something internal. 
Yeah, and then I mean, and then it just went away. I I don't know. Like I tried like trial and error, like excluding some, excluding dairy, excluding mm-hmm. these other food groups. It kind of worked, and then it came back, and I was like, oh, I don't even know what. I, like I'm yeah. I'm running out of ideas how to isolate this, and then suddenly, I went on holiday in uh, Malaysia. Oh, you relaxed. Oh, stress. Your skin got better. <laughs> And, then my skin. and also it's when very I hum- drink water it's, it's very amazing. humid <laughs> and it's also very humid there I should start telling my company that it's like you know I have this like disease it has to do with the symptoms I need holiday I, I need to go on a holiday my teenage daughter I'm not joking you know I don't know you obviously wouldn't know this because you're busy and a smart person but um there's a thing like a stanley it's a cup now that they're all w- walking around with it's like as big as a dumbbell have you seen this uh-uh. TikTok, the power of TikTok. So these girls have these, they're huge gla- gla- you know, glass things with a lid. It's not a water bottle though. Okay. It's different, but it's the same. It's okay. called a Stanley and it has this, and it's huge. Mm. And so she's now, one of my daughters is drinking all this water and she's like, you know, my skin, I bet you my looking good. And I was like, what a novel idea. You're hydrated and your skin looks better. I mean, <laughs> anyway, um, in finishing up, if you... Because again, I, I think you do approach this scientifically and compassionately. If you were going to invite people, um, if they wanted to explore, um, just even if they're if they're they're thinking about stepping up their certain aspects of their lifestyle, or they already are, but they maybe you've you know you're a person who's like turned it up. Um, Justin's turned it up. I'm I'm ready to turn it down. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know what what does that look like? What's the invitation from someone like you coming through all of your experiences um, to to people that maybe haven't gotten the chance yet to feel really good? Baby steps is really important. Take one step at a time. If you really want to change, just half a step is enough. And reach out, reach out to people that may be able to provide help and reach out to you right reach out to to me i answer my dms I, i've got people dming me it's like okay calm down with that wh- <laughs> reach out to me. i'm already overwhelmed <laughs> you, reach, um, people <laughs> reach out to dr latman <laughs> <laughs> I got people ask me like you know I've, I've done this fasting da, 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 I've done this ketone like what do you think and I'll give them my opinion not medical advice no of course but my opinion but I think one aspect of very important thing and, and you mentioned it you know it, what if they're isolated the community thing is, is a super motivator when it comes to healthy lifestyle don't think about doing it for yourself think for a second you are doing it for people around you you're doing it for the people who loves you, who love you, for the people that you love. And you're doing it as a pioneer, especially if you're around people who mm. are unhealthy, as somebody that they can look up to and that yeah. they, they that can be a positive influence. I think that's what my brother and I did for my mom. Because yeah. we grew up, you know, in the family and all of us, like, you know, overweight and... And we started gymming, we started eating healthy and suddenly my mom was like, oh, I can't cook like four cups of rice anymore. I have to cook a cup and a half because they're not going to eat it. And then she ate less like yeah. carbs and she ate more, you know, meat. And yeah. coming from that culture as well, my mom was like, oh, we always talk about like, if you get older, don't eat as much meat, you know, have more vegetarian yeah. because like my mom's side, the Buddhists as well, they're like vegetarian. And I talked about like, importance of muscle mass important of importance of like just supporting yourself when you are growing old and you all these bones getting fragile and you don't want to fall and puncture your organs right and and then she understands and then she she adjusts accordingly i, th- I think that's the big point of it and i'm training now with a guy called jay ferugia based mm-hmm. in miami um and i interviewed him on hvm and podcast and i asked him this is like when you're not motivated when you are like, how do you get motivated? And that was his answer. It's a modified version of his answer. Yeah. But essentially, he said, do it for for someone else. Yeah. Not do it for yourself for once. Yeah, Not think of yourself for once. And, and that's a beautiful thought. Because now you get that health and 
aesthetics as side effect. Mm-hmm. You're not even trying. Yeah. But then everyone else around you, like, they're like, oh, they noticed something. And then they're like, oh, I want to be healthy too. Mm-hmm. You know, or I want to live like you. Or that sort of, that's what gets me. Like, I've got friends who, you know, I play video games and I have friends who I've met maybe once or twice across the country, across other continents that, are, you know, that we're still in touch, just talking online. Mm-hmm. But they're like, oh, you know, I see the work you've done and I'm like working out hard and I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And I feel honored. And at the same time, it works both ways because on the days that I feel like I'm lazy and I'm like, I don't want to to gym today. I'm like, what would they say? What yeah. would they do? You know, yeah. they would say like, get your lazy ass up. Yeah. It's so true. I uh, and and speaking of video games, you you said that there was five ways to preserve your gosh. You have done your, your mental homework. your mental health, and I really was like, oh, he just added. He's acting like he's official, but it was it was learning an instrument, yes. dancing. Yes, you like to boogie, don't you? I I mean, I dabbled. Oh, okay. I dabbled in Borum and Latin. You know, at the beginning of my Did PhD, Latin? I thought. Bob Borum and right, Latin. Right, right, yeah. yeah. I was I was. In my- <laughs> you got a lot of secrets. <laughs> It's ballroom Latin. Are you catching that, Justin? Okay. I mean, like I said, you know, I, mm-hmm. I need to show up. I yeah. need to be be unique so that <laughs> HBMN will hire me and they can't replace me. Or I need to be unique so that I can get accepted into Oxford because they can't, you know, just hire, just get another I saw, straight A. I saw A's. the costumes. <laughs> Some. Some. So um, it was like three years in my PhD. I was like, I'm going to pick up something. <laughs> A skill, right? I was like, so I, I had three three things, three choices. It was rowing. Oh, it was you're, debate. You're not, you're not you're not built for rowing, and you seem too nice for debate. So <laughs> I was a debater back in high school. I was like uh-huh. national. You're level like I appreciate your point of view, but uh, no, that's true. But then, <laughs> but then, a lot of these like people get into debate in in university. They're lawyers. So yeah, they got like serious. <laughs> so the last one, I'm like, you know what? I've always liked watching dancing. I never thought I could. Because I was overweight and I was always conscious. I'm like, the last thing people want to see is see my fat ass shaking it, you know? <laughs> so I never thought about it. But at that time, during my PhD, I already lost all those weight. I already started to live healthy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know what? Why not now? I'll How was it. your natural rhythm? Pretty good. Got to be. I, I had auditioned for the university team <sighs> and I got into the beginner's team representing the university for national level, like university circuits. Granted, smart guy they dancing. always <laughs> granted they always have lack of males, right? <laughs> so we got in all males who auditioned got in. So it's not like I was like good at it. But then I got really into it. I met my best friend Naomi. Um, she was like ballroom, and I was like Latin, and and we push each other like the same thing, you know, like community. You have like the the university team. I was competing like in the varsity match and got a half blue for it, which is like the the sports um award okay for university and i was like wow me getting a sports award yeah i hated exercise back you know in the university but, but it's a sports award for ballroom latin yes okay because it's a dance sport calm down with it's that. called dance sport <laughs> <laughs> i'm just kidding so, so <laughs> listen, listen, listen i could barely run a listen, mile put some lines <laughs> i think it's amazing but you 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 share that in the conversation around you know brain health cognitive function alzheimer's it's dancing Pick up an instrument, pick up a language, yep. lifting weights. Yep. And I, I thought you threw this one in, but you just mentioned it. Immersive. Immersive. Video games. Video games. It is. Yeah. So I just want to put that out for people thinking about Zoom that. Zoom into her face yeah. as she says that. <laughs> no, but it, listen, they say it's also social. So yes. there's a, that aspect. So a lot. Yes. Will you remind everybody where they can find you and um, if they want to talk to you about their ketone situation? I'm, uh, if I end up having like 100 DMs, I'm going to be like, Kathy. <laughs> no, but just remind, just, and, and this doesn't, people can order this online. Yes, you can order it from Amazon. You can order it from hvmn.com. And for you who are listening, if you go to hvmn.com forward slash Gabby, G-A-B-B-Y, you can get 30% off. Booyah. Yeah. So uh, will you direct people how they can yes. see you directly? Because you you do put a lot of videos up with a lot of content and information. So if they just want to go down some little rabbit holes and check some other lifestyle things out, they can. You can find me at Latmanso, L-A-T-T-M-A-N-S-O-R on all social media. I'm most active on Instagram, TikTok trying to. Um, I know. Uh, and uh, at HVMN as well on all uh, social media. 
So you can follow us and, and comment and ask questions. And, you know, some of them, they'll troll and I'll troll back. I'm like, hey, that's what social media is. Yeah. You know, one thing I'm learning right now is like not to take take things seriously on social media when, no. when I get a bad comment or when I get people like, calm down, sit down, <laughs> you know, or like, you don't know your stuff or like, what, what do you know? Yeah. And I'm like, you know what? It's, Close a, video, it. it's a video game. It's a video game. Just like it was a video. Exactly. Game. And my life goes on and I'm happy with my life. Yeah. And that's the most important. Thank you for your time, lad. I really appreciate it. It's, it has been an honor to be here. It's an amazing conversation. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Gabby. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you want to learn more, there is a ton of valuable information on my website. All you have to do is go to gabriellereese.com or head to the episode show notes to find a full breakdown with helpful links to studies, research, books, podcasts, and so much more. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and send them to at Gabby Reese on Instagram. And if you feel inspired, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. This podcast is brought to you by Laird Superfood. In 2015, Laird Superfood was created, but it was really actually created in my kitchen by my husband, Laird. And he was always experimenting with coffees and other ingredients for performance. And lo and behold, Laird Superfood was born. And we have beautiful coffees and creamers and protein bars and other things. But one of the things I'm very excited about is our new greens product. A lot of Americans are not getting enough fruits and vegetables. Something like 85% are not getting enough vegetables and 80% are not getting enough fruit. And we need fiber. So for me personally, I'm always trying to encourage people, and I know this is Laird's philosophy as well, is real food, right? Let's try to get as much of the good stuff, the minerals, the nutrients, the macro, the micronutrients from real food, but it's hard to do. Our soil's different. People are busy. Maybe you don't know what you're getting at your grocery store. So this is a way to get it done and bridge some of those nutritional gaps. And what I also really appreciate about it, besides that it tastes good, I just do it in water first thing in the morning, then I'm done. And then I actually go and have my coffee after. But we use upcycled fruits and veggies, so things that won't go to waste. Maybe they're not really pretty, so we use them in our fruits and veggies. We use no fillers. So your body actually knows what to do with the ingredients. They know how to absorb it. There's fiber. And also, we never use any artificial or natural flavors. Uh, this is something that is harder than people realize because to amplify flavors, a lot of times even you know using natural flavors is the way to do it. So I'm excited to share with you. And if you'd like to try it out, all you have to do is go to LairdSuperfood.com. And if you punch in the code GABBY, G-A-B-B-Y, 20, you will receive 20% off.